fire us, Sam. And we've got some games to review. We're going to talk about the stuff. Movies, uh, games, stuff. I think there's a book in there somewhere. You know, I was thinking we should change it up today, and instead of talking about stuff, we just remain silent for about an hour, and then we put a recording of that on the internet. I'm sure someone would masturbate to that. Well, I guess that already exists. It's called that one creepy girl. The the sweet sound of people sitting in a room using oxygen. I guess. Alright then. Um, there's nothing I can add to that. Nope. So, that is, while that we're is on a the topic train wreck of awkward masturbation material, we played Lollipop Chainsaw. <laughs> it features a cheerleader whose uniform wouldn't fly at any high school in the world. Did you play Lollipop Chainsaw by accident? And do you promise? Uh, no. <laughs> we we no? very deliberately went out and rented it. Yeah, no, it it intentionally found its way into my 360 so that we could review it while I was holding a mini milk crate. I, I, I would have liked to review the other one, but uh, it wasn't available. I don't know, I guess 360 has, like, better policies with rental establishments or something. But either way, so, Lollipop Chainsaw, it's a Suda 51 game, and it shows. Like... The, the same person responsible for the basically every bizarre game ever made. Like, it, it's not really surprising that the idea that the same guy who was like, you know what, I think Shadows of the Damned is a great idea. The, the same person that, that ma gave us No More Heroes and, and the much talked about but never actually purchased Killer7 brought us this. So yeah, um, the story follows Juliet, a high school cheerleader in like a fictional, sunny, uh, sunny, bubbly world where the 80s never really ended. And uh, also, she happens to be a member of a family of monster hunters. Like, there, there's not much else to the plot than that. Like, an, an outbreak of evil undeadness comes out at her school because of one of her uh, classmates. And, yeah, she has to stop it. Is anybody at any point concerned about the fact that there's a zombie invasion? Or do they just take it as rote? Oh, like, you mean the family? Oh, the family doesn't seem to give a crap. But does anybody like... at all seem to care? Oh yeah, yeah. In... All of the all of the normal population is like freaking out, panicking, running for their lives. In the very there, first part not... of the game that I was there when you were playing it, there was even people who shouldn't necessarily know about zombies were uh, being fairly comfortable with this fact. Like Nick takes it surprisingly well. I'll give it that. <laughs> no, when he gets his head cut off, he was like, he totally freaked out, which was the only time somebody had freaked out so far. Yeah, like, oh he God, freaks out because his head body. is removed, not because there's zombies. Like, he sees zombies and is immediately like, oh, I should fight these. Well, fair enough. But, like, no, everyone else in this world is, like, running for their lives. Uh, emergency crews are trying to rescue people. Like, it, it's a big deal. They're like, oh, we need to fix this. Juliet and her family, however, are kind of like, yeah, this is Tuesday. Eh, justified, if they're zombie right. hunters by trade. The the only thing that makes this special is, like, the nature of the invasion, I guess, is kind of a big deal. Like, the, the sensei makes it clear that, oh, th this is particularly bad. We need to actually, like, rush to stop this. It's going to just keep coming. And summoning some kind of weird elder gods. And it's just... Yeah. Elder Gods, apparently Cthulhu's joining the party. Well, they're more like glowy, malevolent sprite-type things. But... Who take the form of a zombie punk rock band. I guess we'll get more to that later. Sure. So, uh, yeah, like, I guess we should talk about the gameplay. So, it, it's a third-person action game, and it really feels like he just went and took the combat engine from No More Heroes removed the motion controls and went, eh, good enough. Like, he 
He switched the inspired by uh, Lucha Libre wrestling to inspired by cheerleading routines. And that seems to be it. You know, instead of Travis's beam saber, Juliet has the, uh, the aforementioned chainsaw. Which has some nice visual effects with, like, all the rainbow stuff streaming off of it. Yeah, your entire goal in attacking with this thing is to stun the zombies so that you can dispatch multiple zombies in the same attack and gain what they call sparkle hunting bonuses. Um, it, it's really basic, like, it's functional. This is something that I would expect to see on, like, an old arcade stand like this. this yeah, uh, it would totally belong in, on, on, like, a stand-up arcade game. Mm -hmm. It, you can pretty much just learn one or two of the, the combos that you pick up from the chop shop. Like, XXY, you mash it twice and then you're decimating things, and that's it. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it's basic, really. I, I want to like this combat system more, but I really went through the entire first boss fight just using the move that the game introduced to me as, this is Juliet's most powerful attack. And I'm like, well, I'm going to get the boss where I can hit him easily, and then I'm just going to spam that as much as I can. And it worked. It seems like they oh, introduced that most powerful attack pretty early in the game. But did you play yeah, through I, the entire game? I I didn't. I got about uh, I'd say probably six or seven hours in. I, I was nearing the end. Allegedly, it's not very long. No, it's a very short game. But like, I'd gotten through a couple boss fights. I I upgraded my character more, but there's a limited number of moves that you learn, so. Like, once you've got those basic combos, it's like, yeah, this works. And I'm going to spam it for the entire game. The end. Um, like, it, Lollipop Chainsaw, it's not a bad combat system. By no means is it, like, offensive like a couple games I've played. I, I didn't, like, hate the game so much as, like, ah, why doesn't this thing work? It's functional. But it's also not particularly good, and it's not particularly stimulating either. Yeah, right? Like, paying full retail for this is kind of ridiculous. I don't see any reason to. When it goes down to bargain prices, like, say, 40 bucks, or it'd be even nicer if it was, like, in the $30 range. <laughs> Those are bargain prices. The Steam Summer for Sale has gaming, not started yeah. yet, but the Amazon Games has been doing a good job of filling in the gap. And I have spent about $40 since the last show, and I've gotten, like, 40 games to show for it. I got Bulletstorm nice. and Borderlands oh, yeah. and Space Marine. We spotted Bulletstorm actually in the bargain bin at a local retailer. And... For $7, and I'm like, yeah, I think this is a thing. You wanted it, but put it back. Yep. I yeah, because got... we had Lollipop Chainsaw to play, and I know if I got Bulletstorm home, I'd be like, I'm going to play this all day. That sequence with the giant robot dinosaur, so good. I don't actually know anything about Bulletstorm. I just bought it because it was in a we pack. We reviewed it! Well, I didn't play it. We reviewed Bulletstorm like a year ago. Did we cover Space Marine? I figure we must have. We did. I played yep. through that entire game and we reviewed it. I think I'm going to have to go back into the archives and listen to that episode because... We're going to have to listen to our own show. <laughs> yep. Yes, we reviewed Space Marine. We reviewed Bulletstorm. Remember, I had the I had the profanity tally. Yeah, pretty much if it had guns last year, we reviewed it. That's true. I, I do specifically remember we reviewed Cod Blobs. Much to my, like, begging that we didn't. I actually remember that show. Uh, I don't remember the Space Marine show. Yeah, we, we reviewed it. There wasn't much to say about it, to be honest. I have this awesome transition set up between Lollipop Chainsaw and Space Marine, which I played. I'm going to uh, put it in Why a Why are we re-reviewing Space Marine? <laughs> because I want to talk about Space Marine, because it's really cool. 
<sighs> but we already reviewed Space Marines. We can give like them, a year ago. We can give them like five minutes to talk about Space Marines. Oh, I, I, I want to at least yeah, go guess, through this uh, transition. We already talked about it on the podcast. I, I guess <laughs> the thing I want to talk about Lollipop Chainsaw for before we finish is that like part of this part of reviewing Lollipop Chainsaw was specifically because I, I figured it would throw Pixie into an angry mode. We would because have we would have rageful pixie. Well, you guys do it to me all the time, um, mostly because, like, because you get unreasonably mad at things. Looking at <laughs> looking at the trailer for this, you'd think it would push like feminist buttons that that this is a thing, but it's Actually, really it's played to such freaking camp that it can't. Well. I can't take it seriously enough to right. get mad at it. You, you, you can tell thing. that they weren't being serious enough with this. Like, that it would push those lines. And the weird, Also, she seems pretty capable. Like, yeah, no, she's she's, stuff, she's like, entirely capable. Stupid fetishized. Yeah. That opening cutscene, I hated that. She's a little bit ditzy. I mean, she she's a little bit, a little ob- bit oblivious to the things that are going on around her. Like, oh, I just performed black magic on your head, and it'll be fine. <laughs> but bad. but those are some of the best lines in the game. I mean, that's the heart of the character. That's where she's so amusing. Uh, all I, of I mean, the other high my... school students also talk in Valley Girl speak, including Nick. Right. <laughs> Yeah, Nick has just played out to be kind of stupid on multiple occasions. I think but like I my ab- kind my of favorite like... line in the entire game that I've heard so far was when she is introducing Morikawa Sensei and is just like uh, uh, Nick refers to him as her teacher, and she's like, "Oh, you speak Japanese," and they go into a conversation where it's like, "No, just that one word." Oh, because she like goes off on like a long spiel. Yeah, Juliet apparently is fluent in Japanese. And he's like, no, I just know that one word. She's like, oh. How is that possible? <laughs> That's badass. Like, there there are some really great dialogue interactions between capable. the characters. Oh, That's really a pretty weird, funny like, scene. Out of... Yeah, like, Juliet speaks fluent Japanese to him. Oh, man. I can't remember what she he's said. She's like, yo, oh, She I specifically didn't. introduces herself... She introduces herself, and then she uh, she does ask, you know, do you speak Japanese? Well, I remember, I remember the, the to speak word being in there, but right, I can't remember in what context. Yeah, she she just does a little little introduction. Um, like overall, she's an entertaining character. She's well designed. Her family is legitimately cool. Like her older sister, who's the like angry punk rock one who has a giant-ass sniper rifle and is fully capable, and even her little sister, who constantly crashes vehicles. Also, can I just take a moment to say everyone in the Lollipop Chainsaw universe is really bad at driving? Yeah, like, everyone. There were school buses crashing everywhere. <laughs> the yep, specific the line that Juliet utters very early on in the game is, Geez, zombies suck a dick at driving. And apparently it's not just zombies, it's everybody. You know, it's still this still isn't as bizarre as bullet storms, I'm going to kill your dick. <laughs> it is, I will kill your dicks. I will kill your dicks. Uh, along with such other jokes as I do not speak train. And uh, yeah, Murder bo- Boner. <laughs> murder Boner. Yeah. Bullet Storm is worth Speaking as somebody who dialogue. uses a lot of profanity and is largely unfazed by profanity, I kind of staggered a little bit when she said that zombies suck dick at driving. It's just so weird nope. and kind of offbeat well, that I was like. It's weird hearing it from that character's voice, I know. No, think. it's weird because that makes no bloody sense. Yeah. Right. It, it wouldn't yeah, have worked if, if it was, like, a more intense word than dick. Dick is silly-sounding enough that it was like, <laughs> okay, it's, that flipped, it's, that it's, tripped it's, me up. Well, you, you're, you're putting zombies, roadhead, and driving all together in one thing, and it's supposed to be a comment about incompetence, but it's not. <laughs> like, that, that is not what she communicated right. to me. <laughs> oh. Overall, Lollipop Chainsaw is a good game. Not quite worth full retail. Which I guess is kind of fitting because, like, teenagers don't really have that strong of a grasp on good how or words not good. are used. I guess. <laughs> like, 
the dialogue is it's like I'm trying to throw some random profane words in there that'll make it edgy. <laughs> There's some hilarious interaction between Juliet's father and Nick later in the game that is just highly entertaining. Overall, if you can get past the kind of uh, just bread and butter combat system, it's decent. If you want a more advanced combat system, by all means, play the God of War games. Like, those are ridiculously good. But, uh, I don't know, if you can live through it and if you're a fan of Suda51, it's totally worth playing. Alright, uh, so these chumps spent their week with Lollipop Chainsaw, and that's all good and well. But instead of that, I spent my week with Lollipop Chain Sword! <laughs> because that's one of the melee weapons in Lollipop, Space Marine. Lollipop, Bolter, and Chain Sword. <laughs> Except there were no lollipops in Space Marine. It would have been nice a much more entertaining game if there had been. Space Marine's really good, especially the late so title if you, card. If, if you want a review of Space Marine, please see show one year ago. I, I never would have thought it is possible to spoil the first ten minutes of a game, but Space Marine is totally subject to spoiling the first ten minutes. Because there's a tiny little intro sequence where uh, there's this planet that's under attack and you're on an orc ship, and you're fighting your way across the orc ship, and then you break the engines and crash the ship, and there's this pile of rubble, and your dude just climbs out of the rubble, and he stands there with his big square jaw, looking like a like a big ol' space marine, and then the title card just drops, and the camera holds that shot for like 30 seconds, and it's amazing. Yep. Games Workshop uh, Space Marines. Yeah, that, that Every was just British to boys sell. power fantasy. It, it, that was just made to sell GW stuff. Yeah, they, they made that so that, well, our sales in Warhammer 40k stuff are going to shoot through the roof. Well, it's also, no, admit, the shooting it is really quasi, good. It quasi-worked on me. I, I finished Space Marine and it was like, I could totally build a small Space Marine army. Hey, wait a minute, that's what they wanted. Uh, I have uh, some very supportive friends who could help me get into miniature gaming if I was willing to go down that rabbit hole. And I'm not going to, but if if anything could have, this game was a pretty good incentive because it has just it's enough hints at the 40k lore, and the 40k lore is of course completely ridiculous. Yeah, no, I'm flat out warning you, if this tempted you in the least, do not under any circumstances play the computer Dawn of War games. Because uh, those will then sell you. Oh. Oh, but now you make me Oops. want to play them. Yeah, I, I'm Dawn not worried War 2, about... Like, if anything would make you want to play a miniature game, it's right there. I think I'm pretty safe against the allure of miniatures, but I might spend a long time on the Warhammer wiki, which I already have reading about the Immortal God Emperor and the Chaos Gods and... The man on the golden toilet seat? <laughs> yes. The ancient golden toilet seat. That is also super futuristic. And he's a giant beacon in hell. So that Yep. It's, Moving it's... on. So yeah, Space Marine. It's cheap now, I guess. Has anybody else had a chance to see Brave? I have nope, not. I one? really want to. Alright, well I guess I shouldn't spoil it for you two then. Is it good? I, I enjoyed it. It went in kind of a weird different direction than I was expecting. Yeah, because... There's a tonal shift, I have heard. There's The first part of the movie is somewhat different There's, from the second the part of the movie. The whole first part of the movie is basically what you saw in the trailers. Yeah. And then anything after that is like... Yeah. Well, I don't know where they're going with this. Because I, like, oh, I, I totally oh, saw that coming. As I mean, as I'm watching the trailer for this, I was like... Did they just spoil the whole movie? No, like, it's just, is, that's is that just it? the beginning. That's, right. That's just the beginning of it, and then there's a whole other conflict that you have no idea was going to happen from just the trailers. Yeah, but really this is the same thing Pixar did with WALL-E, because... If you paid attention to, I guess, the, like, stuff, like the marketing, like, toy lines and stuff like that, you nope. might kind of get an inkling for it, but just going off of, like, commercials, trailers, stuff like that, I don't think you, I don't think anybody would see that coming. No, I have no idea. And I wouldn't call it, like, a twist, it's just, this is what this, the rest of the movie is the, going to be. This look, is what the, the plot of, needed to go somewhere. Yeah, th this is what the rest of the movie is going to be about. And it's not what you think. <laughs> Alright, then. Has anybody seen Amazing Spider-Man? Nope. Uh, no, my dad went and saw it, and... <laughs> I saw Ted. I'll put it that way. 
Really? I went to see Ted Saturday afternoon. How was Ted? Are you a fan of Family Guy? Uh, it's funny in short bursts. Right. You... Uh, would you be a fan of a two-hour episode of Family Guy? I'd be Starring a... Mark Wahlberg. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe, if it was good. Um, I can definitely say that if you're a fan of Family Guy, then the humor style of Ted will be right up your alley. More it, of the same. It hits all of the notes that Family Guy does. There's obscure 80s references, both TV and otherwise. Um, specifically, this movie is fixated on the Flash Gordon film. At multiple levels. Um, they're they're focus, uh, focused on, like creepy 80s music videos at some moments. There's just tons of old jokes like that. Um, Seth MacFarlane does the voice of Ted and, you know, actually makes a self-referential I do not sound like Peter Griffin joke. Um, the humor style is all the same. It's, it's the same type of comedy throughout the entire movie. Um, Milia Kunis is actually hysterical in this. Her name's Milia Kunis. Okay, Mil? I'm thinking Milia Jovovich. Uh, Mila Kunis is hysterical. She's great. I've let this go like three times already today. Like, I'm not letting you do it here. Admitted there, it, it is a kind of tired plot of the guy and best friend get pushed apart by uh, guy's growing relationship. Like, th this has been done it, it, it so many like times. It seems like that plus a boy and his dog type thing. Yeah, it's along those lines. <laughs> except the dog is profane and keeps inviting hookers over to the apartment. So basically, an episode of Family Guy! Uh, Seth MacFarlane, in some awareness of his tendency to make the same show over and over, tweeted that he was going to make two more movies just like Ted, and then re-release it and re-release them all on the same night. Because <laughs> American Dad, The Cleveland Show, and Family Guy are notorious for being the same show and competing with each other on different channels and time slots. <laughs> he he so, is yeah, at least um, aware that he is doing this. Like, overall, Ted is Ted was decent. I had fun. There were some really great moments where I was laughing hysterically. Except he's cautioned me not to go see it. Yeah, there are some jokes that do skirt the lines of good taste ridiculously hard. Like, to the point where it was... Did we need to make that joke? Probably not. Um, I assume, you know, that's a result of his white cisgender male privilege. Yep, pretty much. But, um, like, I had fun. I, I enjoyed it. I'm glad there doesn't seem like we need to do a sequel to this. Like, the one shot will be enough. Um, the the opening narration is probably one of the best things in the movie because it's done by Patrick Stewart in that style of, yeah, we're going to be talking about one thing and then in Seth MacFarlane's writing, we're just going to completely off shot with this weird, bizarre thought stream. And hearing Patrick Stewart do that is just great. Like he's talking about the most powerful thing in the world being the wish of a young boy. Except for Apache helicopters. Because those have missiles and guns, and they will just kill you. That's persuasive Hearing argument. Hearing Patrick Stewart deliver that line is just fantastic. Patrick Stewart was involved with this. He was. He's the narrator. All right, then. So, yeah, like, I enjoyed Ted. I thought it was funny. I, I just, I love him in the why the fuck meme as um, Picard. With that, yeah, with that gesture, you know the one. <laughs> I know that meme. <laughs> I, I love that. Um, but yeah, like, if you're a fan of Family Guy, go see Ted. You'll, you'll enjoy yourself. Has anybody seen the really bad Final Fantasy VII trailer with the excessive movie guy voice? No. Should we? I think we'll take a break real no, quick, but, and you can listen to this, because the movie guy about... voice is crazy. Uh, is this a trailer for the new release of the PC game that's coming you, out? Yeah, you it's have the, the link in it's the... just a re-release of Final Fantasy VII with maybe some strange mechanical changes, such as ways um, to refill your character's health. Yeah, that that bothers me. But we'll Did we'll talk about it in a in second. The, we'll okay. put the link in the doc. Uh, I'll get you a link. Doc me, class. This is 
one of those things where I never actually played this. This trailer is not great. <laughs> this trailer is problematic. Well, it is just crappy. <laughs> I was gonna say, how is it problematic? It's problematic in that it sucks and is dumb. That's the only thing that's wrong with it. Alright, opening trailer. Buffer race! Yeah, except you're gonna be hearing it through my headphones. Oh, wait, yeah, you're right. Crud. I didn't think this through. <laughs> Except it still looks like ass. <laughs> it still looks exactly the same. I don't know why you wouldn't, like, clean up the graphics for... If you were gonna do a re-release like that. Okay, so that trailer proved one thing to me. What's that? These graphics have not held up, sir. The graphics are are what they were, and I I even I want them to make an HD remake because everybody does. They put out a fairly Everyone does. astounding opening cinema of a uprezzed Final Fantasy VII opening sequence. But right, as a tech demo for the PS3. The other thing that's wrong with that trailer is that movie guy voice is terrible. They just have this yeah. trailer voice, and it, it hurts. It's the most generic introduction ever. A that story trailer. Of triumph, betrayal, and conflict. Well, that's every story. I feel would be approximately 1,000 times better if they just muted the audio channel that has the trailer guy voice on it. If they... Wait, I've got this. We need to uh, invent a meme where we take that introduction and just put it on random things. Yeah, just anything. Because it would, it, it would have just as much impact the Ted trailer. attached to anything. Like, th that was nothing about Final Fantasy VII. There, there was nothing in there that was unique to that game. <laughs> So I feel Swear like just had this audio track sitting around. We need to do this. Yeah. This needs to be something that gets added to the site. Take that video and edit your own video with a random thing of your choosing and just post it. Times like this, I wish I just had video editing software sitting around. I totally have video editing thing. software sitting around. Okay, pick... Pick your thing and edit that in. Maybe we can do a, a contest with it where uh, we'll each make one and have people vote on which one's the best. I think I'll append the TED trailer with that sound over it to the end of the show. Th this sounds awesome. So, I feel like Square Enix hates themselves for doing this PC re-release without significant changes because... By significant, we need... None except for the little app market thing. Except for ones that might be really dumb. And it's like... Yeah, right. Like, I, I guarantee you, I know how they could sell millions of this uh, thing instantly. If they were just like... The thing is, hey, they will anyway. Hey, we added some DLC where you actually can revive Eris. Like, there it is. There. Uh, sold. Oh, God. So many I... people are going to buy that. Thousands, millions of people are going to buy it just for that, if that were a thing. I have enough respect, even if potentially misplaced, for the global audience that they would just think that was really dumb. <laughs> I I, nope. I can only hope. These are Square Enix fans here. This is these are Final Fantasy fanboys and girls. Pixie is right when she says that they will sell some amount of this despite it being dumb. But oh, guarantee. It's another release of Final Fantasy VII. Hell, I bought it on the PS3 market when it came out. 
But what they're going to do? Sitting in the other room. Square Enix had this crazy asset of audience hunger for an HD remake of Final Fantasy, and everybody knew that if they got to the point where they needed the money, they could just do that. They could farm it out to Vicarious Visions or some other studio if they needed to. But just up res Final Fantasy VII and release it, and you sell two to three million copies, guaranteed. And I feel like what they're doing here is they're depleting that audience hunger. Uh, this is not going to be big enough to get that two to three million, but it's going to be big enough to make that two to three million not available to them anymore. Because people are going to sate themselves on this. It's like, if people wanted to play the original game, I still have my PlayStation 1 discs. And also, I have an emulator on this computer. So, same here. no problem. I, if I want to play the original Final Fantasy VII, I'll just do it. No problem. Right. So I'm not going to yeah, buy I'm... this, whereas I would buy an up, up graphics version. Right, I bought it for the PlayStation 3 because I'm constantly worried that my uh, PS1 memory cards one of these days are just going to be like, nope, internal battery fail. Because that's bound to happen eventually. Those things can't be good forever. No, of course not. Likewise, um, I just wanted a copy for my PSP. I still think it's a fantastic uh, device, even if Sony was like, nope, after it was out for a year. I enjoyed my PSP pretty well. But while I say I still have my PlayStation 1 discs, if I wanted to play Final Fantasy 7, I would not go out into my garage and dig through some boxes for the PlayStation 1 discs. i just have ISOs and use them in an emulator. And I could put those ISOs on my phone if I wanted and play Final Fantasy 7 on my phone because technology. For free. Of technology. Um, so yeah, more stuff. Yeah, uh, I've got a list of releases here. Yeah? What are um, we looking at? Let's see. So within the next week, uh, Quantum Conundrum comes out, well, came out today for uh, PlayStation Network, um, comes out tomorrow, uh, the 11th of July, for Xbox Live Arcade. Um, let's see, there's an iOS game called Pocket Heroes coming out on July 12th. Just some adventure RPG type thing on iOS. Uh, Time Travelers for the uh, 3DS, PSP, and PS Vita will be out um, on July 12th. Yeah. Uh, the idea you should sort of be getting from hearing this list, listener, is that not much that's worth a damn is coming out. <laughs> nope, we're pretty down right now. There has been, like, an updated re-release of Frogger for the arcade called Frogger Hyper Arcade Edition. I think it's on XBLA. It's like, that is probably the largest budget release of this week, is a Frogger uh, remake. Heroes of Ruin, out for the 3DS on the 17th. I don't even know what that is. Uh, action role-playing game. Uh, developed by N Space and published by Square Enix for the Nintendo 3DS. It's already out in Europe, I guess. Has been for like a month. Okay then. These are things. It's a big name publisher, so. Uh, but Square Enix and publishes. And 3DS is getting something. Uh, Square Enix publishing for the 3DS. That's kind of not what yeah, I'd expect. That's okay. I figure if you want to publish something on PS Vita, then Square Enix is just sort of automatic because they're nearly a first-party publisher for Sony. And Nintendo usually first-party publishes small releases for their platforms. I guess not. I don't know. I, I think my game money right now is kind of looking towards uh, Sins of the Solar Empire Rebellion. I'm kind of in an RTS mood. I'm always in a spacey mood. I'm... Really interested in seeing where this next installment is going with it. Well, that's a game so, that can uh, probably carry you all the way through the summer drought, because you can just play it forever. Right. Among right. The... Unfortunately, there's oh. still no story mode. That's what's bothering me about this franchise. Like, you potentially got a really epic storyline for a single-player campaign, and you're not doing it. 
Like, correct me if I'm wrong, but even, like, the Civ games have a single-player story mode. Well, they have a single-player campaign mode. I don't know that there's much narrative associated with it, but it is a single-player mode. Right. I don't know, I'm, th this is kind of going to be a work week for me to finish up my summer school classes, but uh, I'm, I'm thinking next week I met, might uh, be acquiring this. I, too, am spending most of my time on summer school, and I have this enormous back catalog of, like, AAA games that are only, like, a year old that I got for cheap on Amazon, and yet still, I'm kind of just sitting in my, in my chair waiting for Assassin's Creed 3 and SimCity. Like, come on, release them! October slash February, let's do this. Stupid games I want to play not being out yet. How dare they. How dare they. Um, let's see. What else are we... We've been playing a lot of League of Legends lately. Yes, and the new champ is kind of ridiculous. In a good We've way or a correctly. bad way? Uh, in a great way. So, his name is Jace. He's got the subtitle, The Defender of Tomorrow. Um, pretty much they thought that, you know, Victor's a villain who doesn't have a nemesis. We should give him one of those. So yeah, now we've got the, like, good inventor. The problem is in doing that, they've kind of turned Victor into not only a hypocrite, but a Saturday morning cartoon character. Because, like, Jace's story goes that he was an inventor, and then Victor broke into his lab and stole his stuff and fled uh, to his own city. <laughs> and then twiddled his mustache. And, yeah, and then Jace decided, oh, I, I should, uh... I should fix this. So he invented his mercury hammer and stormed into Zwan and beat the hell out of Victor and his cult and took his stuff back. So, like, Victor's big problem in his storyline was that someone stole credit for inventing Blitzcrank. And so he, like, swore vengeance against that guy and upgraded himself so that no one could ever claim his inventions again because they would be him. So, like, the idea that Victor would go and steal someone else's stuff doesn't make sense. But, uh, yeah, um... I must Jace say about really Jace cool that Jace that has the only jaw squarer than Captain Titus from Space Marine. Jace has the squarest he jaw. Of, he reminds me of, uh, Doc Hammer from, uh, uh, Dr. Horrible's sing-along blog. Yes. Like, he's that level of stupid heroism. Um, so, he's the only champ who starts the game already knowing his ultimate. He, he just gets a free rank in it, because every time you level it up during the normal uh, 6, 11, and 18, actually 6, 13, and 18, he, uh, he basically just increases the extra uh, passive ability that it does when you use it. But otherwise, its main function is to switch him from being either an AD ranged carry or a melee bruiser on command. So, like, he's one of those characters where, like, there's, like, there's no wrong way to build him depending on what you're playing him as. He can be a really great jungler, he can be a great top melee bruiser, or he can be a really great bottom AD carry if you give him the support. He, he is potentially whatever role you need to fill, except for... Uh, support because he really doesn't have any support abilities. Everything he does is kind of damagey, and uh, he he definitely isn't a tank because he has no abilities to mitigate damage. Like he has to be played really well because you have to understand what all of his abilities do. Like you have to know that hmm, I'm getting a lot of mana. Well, I should switch to my hammer form because every time I hit something with it, it regens mana for me. Um. If you're chasing someone, you know that you've got the option of either uh, slowing them down if you're in hammer form and using one of your moves, or you can go to your ranged form, uh, drop your acceleration gate, and increase your speed, or potentially throw a really far-flying projectile. Like, he is just all about options and playstyle. And that's what's really cool. He's really high skill cap. Because every move does something different, and to use Jace properly, you need to be using all of your moves. Otherwise, his damage is kind of underwhelming. But when you start stacking moves correctly, 
he has absolutely ridiculous burst and control. Unlike Lee Sin, who's just always amazing. So, I feel like there needs to be another bot difficulty between beginner and intermediate, because intermediate bots are really crazy, and at first I was wondering, uh, we didn't get a good sense of Jace's abilities because there were some crazy intermediate bots. We played a game that went really long, and my experience lately has been that because bots get extra gold, if you have a game that goes long, that bots just become unbeatable, even if you start with perfect territory and better kills, uh, bots just have oh. infinite gold. I think that also depends on the composition of the bot team as well. Like, what, what we faced in that game that just went bad for us was it was three tanky bruisers. If I remember correctly, it was Blitzcrank, Nunu, and Amumu. And a Soraka. So not only are these guys just not taking damage, they've also got someone just constantly pouring heals on them. Right. Uh, I, I did not know that it was possible. I thought if you stood in the enemy summoner pool, it just insta-killed you. Like, it didn't do damage, no, it just, just killed you. you. But it turns out that is yeah. not the case, because... Nope. We have had bots standing in our summoner pool for, like, substantial periods of time over the yeah, course of the last Yeah, we watched an Alistar just stand there for five seconds and not go down. And, like, a Cho'Gath, too. It was... And the Cho'Gath had its had lots of stacks, so the Cho'Gath was larger than the whole summoner pool, but he's yep. getting a laser in his face, and he didn't care. So, yeah. Um, I don't know, I feel that some of this was, like, patch-related errors, because I've been noticing this week there are occasions when you'll see, like, a move clearly hit a champ, and it just won't register. I I've seen that a couple times this week. Also, I've seen what might be server-side lag if the Riot's servers are not running at full speed. Uh, maybe it's just my internet connection has been really crappy over this week, but I've been getting stuttery lag that I've never gotten before. But I have a theory about what I like in RPGs, that having bots outgrow you does not fit into very well. That's The reason I don't really like Diablo is because you can never get built enough to just be sort of destroying the enemies and progressing really easily. <coughs> because Clearly you've never played a barbarian. <laughs> okay, fair enough. But if you get built in Diablo, then you will just very quickly get to the point where the enemies are scaled to you, and enemies can scale upwards forever. Whereas in a game like The Binding of Isaac, there is... You, their runs are like 40 minutes long, and there's fixed bosses that have particular strengths, and the bosses are always a certain difficulty, and the goal in the game is sort of to get your character to be well-built enough that the boss battles are just trivial, and that's the part that I enjoy in the RPG elements, is getting a character that is so good that I don't <coughs> need to work hard anymore. And in... Long games against beginner bots, that's easy, because beginner bots are really dumb, and they don't build well, and they have, like, crappy stats. And so you get full gold, and you stack four Trinity Forces, and then you just one-shot them, and it's great. But if you go to 40 minutes in an intermediate bot match, you are you either have to win in the next 10 minutes, or you've lost. Right. <clears throat> Yeah, it gets really difficult the way the bots currently scale and the way the, the AI is functioning right now. I will say, I, I know I uh, heap a lot of abuse on Obsidian for Knights of the Old Republic 2. That is one thing they did really well, is... Fixing the poor combat of the first game? The, in the first game, you had a level cap. It was right. 20, if I remember correctly. That, that was, was not enough to comfortably finish the game. Yeah, that last boss fight's always really uncomfortable, especially if you, you know, dump a lot of stats and say charisma. Anyway. Right. Um, I would like to talk my way through this fight. You can't do no. that by the final <laughs> boss fight, no. Um, 
But one thing they did was they removed that level cap, and so by the end of the game, I could just walk into a room and just go, Death Field, and everyone drops. <laughs> yep. Uh, that was a critical failing of the first Knights of the Old Republic, or maybe not even so much of a failing, but an interesting thing, is that there was a light side move called uh, Force Whirlwind, and you could upgrade Force Whirlwind into Force Wave, but Force Whirlwind is like a 10 second stun, so any fight you can just Force Whirlwind beat on them for 10 seconds and then run around in a circle until Force Whirlwind has cooled down and you cast it again. But then, <coughs> if you upgrade it to Force Wave, Force Wave is kind of useless, and you can't use Force Whirlwind anymore. So you have made your character substantially worse by proceeding through the skill tree. Um, <coughs> and then, of course, the light side characters are a waste of my time, so I played as a dark side character, and you had an ability called Drain Life, which would, you know, drain health from the enemy and give it to you. And uh, that upgraded into Death Field, where you could use it on multiple char enemy characters at once. It got so OP by the end of the game. That sounds good to me. I like being OP. That's my favorite part are. of RPG elements. So yeah, um, I guess I'm going to focus on trying to bang out some kind of review for... Sins of the Solar Empire before next week. Any other plans? Um, you've almost got your... Uh, War Machine Army finished painting, so there's I that. am currently three models away from having a fully painted War Machine Army ready Snaps to go. That. See, I have a license like, of I... Civilization V sitting in my back pocket, so if you try and play Sins of the Solar Empire and I play um, Civilization V, then we'll both play games that are a thousand hours long over the course of one week. I have, a sp I have space ooh, in mine, Oh, that so reminds I win. me. That reminds me. I'm gonna have a new PC gaming rig by yeah, this weekend. Yeah, Pixie's actually it's getting into proper PC gaming. You Ooh. know, with a desktop. <laughs> As opposed to carting my laptop everywhere I go, yes. Screw laptops. But I must say, that's one of the other things I enjoyed about Space Marine, is it's been the first opportunity to use the graphical prowess of my new computer to its fullest. And I was just sitting back with my gamepad and my mouse and my huge monitor and settings on high, and I was like, oh my god, this is amazing. I How am, many monitors are you I, up to I'm now, glad Carl? the Unreal 3 engine is keeping you happy. A merely five. There's, there's a slot for a sixth that I have not filled yet, but someday. He's using five monitors at once. Five monitors. Which the RAM in your computer must hate you. Actually, the experience of Space Marine was really augmented by that because I had Space Marine right in the middle and then two monitors on either side all of which have the War Machine or the Warhammer 40k wiki on it so I'll be like article about a chaos god article about orc technology I'm um, killing orcs and killing chaos gods like, yeah. why do I have a feeling Pyro is going to be buying miniatures before <laughs> the end of the month I'm just please don't go to Warhammer is all we ask I'm not going to play Please. miniatures Games Workshop is evil. I would only play miniatures if they were digital. We're gonna get a lawsuit from Games Workshop now. Well, eh, if Blizzard so... hasn't, then who will? <laughs> Games Workshop is not capable of lawsuits, apparently. I suppose. Alright then, so, uh, yeah, I guess that's it for tonight. Next week comes the incredibly long RTS-based show. Yes, all of the RTS grind. Though no, now I've actually committed to playing Civilization V. Me too, I've got freaking homework. <laughs> it's worth it. Sucks all to right. be you two. <laughs> all right, folks, so until next time. I'm Pixie. I'm Sim. And I'm Pyrosim. And you've been listening to Nerd Talk. <laughs>